I want to share with you this morning what the thief on the cross saw. Something that changed his life. Something that, that caused him to have a destiny and, and, and broke the power of sin and broke the, the, the plan that the enemy had for their life. You know, every person, God has got a plan. It says that God, there's a purpose and a plan that God has for our life. But also the enemy comes and he wants to bring his purpose and his plan of destruction that will destroy the things of God. He gets great pleasure because you see, whether you know it or not, you might have a low opinion of yourself and you may not think much of yourself, but you really are God's prized possession. God loves you so much that he gave his son to die for you. There's no greater love that anybody could ever have that God than God has for you right now. Well, you're, while we're yet sinners, Jesus died for us. You see, God is love. He doesn't have degrees of love. He loved me while I was a sinner. He loves me today just the same. And this whole purpose and his whole plan is if he can get his word into my heart, if somehow or other he can come and, and cut off the enemy's plan for my life. And I was on the road to destruction. I don't know about you, but I was heading on a road to destruction. But I thank God that Jesus came into my life and God touched me and God ministered to me and, 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 and revealed himself to me. And I believe that this thief on the cross, he saw some things that changed his life forever. I want to do a little bit of a background, if I can, for a moment. From the moment Jesus was born, Satan was trying to destroy him. You know, from the moment that you were born, Satan was trying to destroy you also. Uh, Satan was trying to destroy him by death or by deception. Today, Satan is trying to destroy God's people just the same way. King Herod, after he heard a king of the Jews was born in Bethlehem, he, Herod sent soldiers to kill every male child under the age of two years to try to destroy this king. He was so full of jealousy and rage. And when Jesus came of age and began his ministry, Satan came to deceive Jesus. He said, if you are the Son of God, come on, if you are the Son of God, prove it. Prove it to me. Show yourself. See, Jesus could have just said, okay, he could have proved it, but that wouldn't have done any good for you and me. I praise God that he paid the price, aren't you? See, what you allow yourself to see will change the way you think. What you allow yourself to see. If you allow yourself to see yourself as a defeated person or as a, as a broken person, or, and if you, your confession about you today is that I'm no good and I'll never make it, I want to tell you, that makes it very, very difficult for God to move on your behalf. You see, it's how you see and what you, what you allow yourself to see. And I want to tell you today, there's something that's got to rise up within us that will cause us to rise above the enemy's plan and start to declare whether I feel it or not, whether I'm experiencing it or not, no matter what's going on, I'm going to declare what God says about me rather than what I feel or what I sense. What you allow, what you allow in your life is what's going to dominate and control your life. You see, Jesus' life was characterized by goodness. He was a good God. He literally poured his life out to people. He poured himself out. In Acts 10.38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus healed the sick. He fed the hungry. Jesus went around doing good, and the people killed him for it. It wasn't long before Jesus' crucifixion that people were laying down their garments in the streets as Jesus rode through on a donkey. They laid their, their garments down on the street, and as that donkey walked on those things, they cried out, Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. But we know that something happened. There was a shift. 
Something happened in the realm of the spirit as Satan's hordes, as it started to influence people, as, his, as he got into people. Friend, today we're seeing people. We're looking at people. I can't understand today what's going on in the minds of women that they would even want to even have a bill that would destroy babies at 22 weeks. That passes all natural comprehension. I say, thank God for them that their mother didn't have that law in their day. Or they may not be here today. I can't understand, but you see, there is an enemy who's pouring out his wrath and his fury and his lies and his deception and everything he can into humanity to stop man from following the Christ, to stop you and I from understanding. And I've got news for you today. There is so much more that God has made available for us that we are not even touching the sides of yet. There is the exceedingly abundantly above God. Amen? There's a God who, who, who wants to totally restore, who, who totally wants to heal and deliver. These people who he fed, who he looked after, wanted to kill him. He was beaten, unmerciful. The crowds he healed and fed now cry out, crucify him. Crucify him. The people who were crying out, Hosanna, many of those people were turned. We're seeing today in our church history, in the life of the church, as we read our scriptures, we see there that as a king was, it came into power, it said, and this king did evil in the sight of God. Then we find out that the next king came through and he did what was right in the sight of God. Friend, I want to say this, we have to choose whether we're going to do evil in the sight of God or we're going to do what's right in the sight of God. There's a choice that we have to make. We have to choose. We can't go and just play with the, with the crowd. We've got to, I believe that we've got to be separate. We've got to be called out. We've got to be different. You believe that today? The 12 who were nearest to him forsook him. Peter even went as far as to say, I do not know this man. Peter was one there that saw the way that Jesus fed the 5,000. He saw the, 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 the people there that were full of leprosy, how he just spoke to them. He saw how, how Jesus had healed the blind eyes. Friend, I want to tell you this. It doesn't really matter what you've seen in the natural We've got to catch a glimpse of this man that we call the Christ, the Son of the living God. We've got to get a glimpse of him piercing down even from the cross of Calvary, looking right into your very eyes, right into your very soul, and say to you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and what I'm doing, I'm doing for you. To break every stronghold of the enemy, to break everything, that the enemy would want to do. Satan is the father of lies and deception. He will deceive even God's very elect, the Bible says. John 10 says, The thief comes, uh, does not come except to steal, to kill and destroy. But I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. How many people want that abundant life? Come on, give us, lift up your hands if you want abundant love. Father, help us to break through the lies of the devil. Help us to break through the, the onslaught of the, what the wicked one would try to do to us. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and we'll give you all the glory. The Bible says in Mark chapter 15, it says in verse 22, and they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. When they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them. 
to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. And with him they also crucified two robbers, one on the right and the other on the left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered among the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others himself he cannot save. How many people are glad that while Jesus was there and as people mocked him and as people were blaspheming him and as people were spitting at him and as people were reviling him, it dealt deep in his heart, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he was enduring it. Amen. You see, Jesus made a choice that day. He said, I'm not going to allow the enemy to stir me. I'm not going to allow people's opinions. I'm not going to allow what the enemy wants his plan to be fulfilled. I am going to fulfill the requirement that God has for my life. I'm going to pay this price that Joe was talking about today. And friend, I want to tell you, if you and I took time to examine exactly what God purchased for you and for me at the cross of Calvary, what he purchased, I want to tell you, we would live above and not below. We would live so far above and not allow the enemy's lies to pull us down, to bring discouragement or disappointment. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabacha, whatever, (laughs) shokobundi. which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that, that he said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. I've heard people say that the people around, you see, all these people, they knew who he really was. They, they knew about the, the great patriarchs of old. They knew about Elijah. They knew about the power of God. They knew about the anointing. They knew, they knew, they knew. But they didn't really know who. They'd heard about, they'd seen, they'd they'd, they'd heard the stories. When they said he's calling for Elijah, fear started to grip. This is what I heard a, a great teacher start to say, that fear gripped their hearts because they knew that this man Elijah, that he would call down fire from heaven. And they were scared that if they were wrong, and if they were really crucifying the Christ, and if Elijah really did come, he might call down fire and destroy them all. So one of the guys said, be quiet. (laughs) And he goes and puts a little bit of wine in a stick and lifts it up and thinks, well, man, if he does come, perhaps I might find favor with him. (laughs) Because I'm being nice to Jesus. Let's see. If this man does come back. Because someone, it says in verse 36, then someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. (laughs) Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood opposite opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Father, I ask you today that you'll help us catch a glimpse of this Jesus. Help us catch a glimpse of this Christ that will change our thinking, that will change our lives. Luke 23, 39 speaks about two thieves hanging either side of him. 
They blasphemed him, saying, save yourself and us. They obviously had heard about Jesus too. They'd heard about the miracles that he performed. They'd heard about blind eyes being opened. Heard about 5,000 people. The Bible says that when Jesus did all these things, his fame went out before him. It wasn't done in secret. It wasn't done in hiding. It wasn't done trying to, you know, do something in secret. It was done openly. These people had heard it. But I would imagine that they'd also heard other things. They'd heard what the Jewish leaders were trying to portray. They were telling the lies and, and saying different things. And, and so people were confused. Blasphemed him, saying, save yourself. That obviously has heard about him. Now they also listened to people's opinions as they walked by, as they walked through life. You know, walking through life today, how many know you can pick up a lot of things? Pick up a lot of rubbish. People mocked him. The Jewish people mocked him. People's opinions. One of the most dangerous challenges in life is people's unqualified opinions. I want you to let that just sink in today. People's unqualified opinions. How many people know that most people have got opinions on everything? I say opinions are like armpits. We all have them and most of them stink. Opinions, opinions, opinions. And we've all been affected by opinions. I want to tell you today, friends, that even Christians that have been saved 40 years are still being held bound and bound up by people's opinions that are still echoing in the chambers of our mind. Things that we've heard, things that have been said, things, unqualified opinions, whether it be a mechanic that says, brother, your car is perfectly safe. <laughs> And then you go and have a crash around the corner. Or a doctor who gives you a result and says you'll be okay, only to find out that he's misdiagnosed you. You see, no matter whether it's a mechanic or a doctor, the results can be fatal. Same with the things of God regarding salvation. See, I am totally convinced today and we may totally understand that Christmas Day is not the day that Jesus got born, but it's a day that people celebrate the birth of Jesus. As a Christian, we can start to have arguments about that. We can start to say claws and all these things and, 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 and build a great argument and all of a sudden you know, and, and I want to tell you I went through this as a, as a Christian, as a pastor, I wouldn't allow a Christmas tree on our platform. I had X seven day Adventist people in my ear. I had this people in another ear. I was totally confused. I got so miserable about the whole thing. I wanted to, to cancel Christmas altogether. <laughs> Easter is another. Oh, glory to God, don't go there. But we know that it's not the day that Jesus was crucified, but it's the day set aside where people celebrate and, and experience. And so I, I, I see, uh, of, you know, during Christmas, and we have Channel 7 and Channel 9 at the Domain and, and somewhere else, and we've got all these beautiful orchestras and these people dressed in beautiful clothes singing about a Savior. Friend, I want to tell you, this Jesus is not put in a bushel. He has been exposed. They talk about how a baby was born. They talk about this and they talk about that. Then at Easter, there's so many things going on about how he died the crucifixion and so forth and so from. Friend, pe people know, but people make choices. And as Christians, we also make choices. I've heard people say, don't get too much of the Holy Ghost, you'll blow up. 
Well, I've never seen anybody blow up from too much Holy Ghost. But I've seen a lot of people die from the lack of it. I've seen a lot of people defeated and smashed by the devil because they haven't got the Holy Ghost. I've heard people say, well, I want to walk the middle of the road. Well, I want to tell you, friends, you get on the highway, go on to Brisbane, and you try walking down the middle of the road, that's the most dangerous place you can ever walk. I want to be a middle of the road. What is a middle of the road Christian? Is that perhaps one foot in heaven and one foot in hell? <laughs> what is it? Where See, opinions. My dad told me people who went to church were weak and needed a crutch. Bad advice. So the thieves join in with the popular opinion that's going down. They start cursing. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. You see, they didn't want to die, especially such a painful death. In crucifixion, your bones and joints are dislocated. I watch those Tongans. Oh, dear God. The big boys. And I looked at some of those little halfbacks. <laughs> and you hear the crunch. But I've seen those big, big, strong football players when they dislocate their shoulder, the pain, the agony. I, I was sitting on my lawn the other day and I was doing the edges. Just sitting there doing the edges, I was cutting with a saw, but the saw was behind me. And I'm not going to do it now, but I turned around to pick up the saw, and I don't know what happened. But a pain shot through my shoulder all the way down my arm, and I was in agony. And I was sitting there on my own. Nancy was out, of course. <laughs> And I'm sitting there in agony. And I'm hanging on. And I'm, I'm looking at her. And I got, look, I, look, to be honest with you, the pain was so intense, I thought I was going to throw up. When I come home, I was still, I, was, I shifted. Now she's, oh, she's gone, praise God. <laughs> I was still sitting under the tree. My arm was still sore. All I did was that. <laughs> I don't know, I must have done something to a nerve. I don't know what I did. But in crucifixion, your bones and joints are dislocated. They, they pull pressure on their hands to, to take the pressure off their lungs. And then eventually they've got to let go again and just hang there again. And they're backwards and forwards because, you see, when the weight of your body slowly squeezes the air from your lungs and you suffocate. This went on for six hours. Might even be more. The thieves were tied. Jesus was nailed. A crown of thorns pierced his skull. His back was smashed by 39 stripes of a centurion's whip. Blood would have been flowing from his battered body. Thieves on the cross. One, both of them saying, if you're really the Son of God, they also blasphemed him. They also cursed him. They joined in with the crowd. Blood flowing from this battered body. 
And then all of a sudden, they heard sounds like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God. In Luke 23, verse 32, it says, there are also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they'd come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals. They drove those nails into his hands and feet. They raised that, Christ, that cross in the air. And as they did, they mocked him. I don't know, I'm trying to paint a picture here today of one who paid a price for you, not so as that you will suffer, but that you will rise above every circumstance and every situation. He's hanging there with the two thieves either side, also reviling him, also cursing him. Heard the people go past, ah, who are you? The religious leaders were mocking him. Time went by as they're agonizing. They're watching this Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, my God, my God. But then all of a sudden, these Thieves, as they looked, they hear Jesus. Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What they're doing, they're doing in ignorance. Father, forgive them, forgive them. And all of a sudden, one, instead of cursing, now starts to listen. Now starts to pay a little bit of attention. Now starts to look in a, perhaps a different way. He starts to think a little bit different. They started to, instead of Reviling, they started to listen. One of them in particular, all of a sudden he realizes that while he was cursing Jesus, Jesus was loving him. I think one of the great things is to realize that this Jesus really loves me. Stop cursing and started to listen. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I would imagine would have started thoughts in his mind, how can this man pray forgiveness over this crowd who are killing him? He should be cursing them. He be began to realize that while he was cursing Jesus, Jesus was loving him. While they were using his name in vain, he was calling, calling his name. Where were you when Jesus found you? Were you in some little ivory temple, so beautiful and clean? Or were you in a pit of despair and filth and rubbish and mess? That's where I was. I'm praying that God will help us, that God will help us restore our first love that we ever had for Jesus. Calling his name and making intercession for him. The thief, now listening, instead of mocking, he says, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said these words, Today you'll be in paradise with me. My dad, who thought I was weak, 
but because I became a Christian at 27. And I want to tell you, when I became a Christian, my life was a mess. We used to sing a song. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful out of my life. My dad, a man who was addicted to alcohol and gambling and knew more filthy jokes than you could ever believe or imagine. My dad came to a church meeting. There was an African-American preacher. He sang beautiful songs and danced, and he did mimes. Dad liked him. Jody used to, every time Dad would come to church, would go up to her, him and say, Granddad, will you give your life to Jesus? And he would curse Jody, and he would swear at Jody. But Dad liked this guy, and for the first time, he stopped cursing and began to listen. My dad gave his life to Jesus that night at the age of 84. I'm telling this story today because I want us to return to our first love. And I believe, again, earnestly seek the Lord. This nation needs to return back to God. Amen? I, I feel a little bit emotional right now because I know my dad. But to see him go out there that day and surrender his life to Jesus. And Ruckinson McKinley was the preacher. And there were hundreds of people came out on that altar. And it was taken so long, and I know my dad had a, what do you call it, a short, you guys know him. And I thought, he's going to pull the pin any minute. He's going to walk away from this any minute. And then Ruckin said one thing that I thought my dad would never do because my dad was very, very proud. In all of his mess, he was proud. <laughs> and then Ruckin said, would you all raise your hands? And I thought, oh, God, we'll never do that. <laughs> and next one I saw my dad, he's only five foot two or five foot three, my dad. And in the crowd, I saw these little hands go up. <laughs> and he wept his way to Jesus Christ. I, I pray that you can catch my drift today. Australia needs Jesus. But Jesus needs us. He's not going to do it without us. He needs us. And I pray that God, when we, when we come and worship, I, I pray that it's not just singing a melody to God. I pray that we open our hearts so God can find access into us to touch us. Amen? People say to me, Neil, why are you doing what you're doing? I'm 79 in a couple of weeks, a couple of months rather, two months. I'd rather be found here today in this place where God wants me than some anywhere else in the world. Amen.
I want to be doing what God's called me to do. Because I understand that though I, we might have so many years on this planet, there's an eternity. Amen? There's an eternity. I'm just going to ask you all to stand with me today. And I wonder if we can pray a prayer of dedication. I think if we could get the musicians back up again, and I'd love to sing that song, I Dedicate to You. And you know, if I can say this, we had a, Jody had, had a, all a different song service and everything like that, but our main guitarist couldn't make it today because he had to work. And so they just quickly selected some songs. But as they were singing those songs, every one of those songs fitted in with what I was sharing this morning. I believe that God is on our case. I, I, please don't underestimate what God can do. Whether we're just a few, there might be churches in, on the Sunshine Coast with thousands. I don't know and I don't really care. I'm not looking at that. I'm just looking at us here today. That we say, God, I want to be the best I can for you in whatever time we've got left on this planet. When you come back, I want to be found. Whether he comes back in our lifetime or what, I don't really care. I'm going to, be, I'm going to meet him somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to meet him somewhere, whether it's in the air or whether it's on the planet. or if there's, another, there's another six or seven versions of that too. <laughs> Opinions. I just know I'm going to meet him. And when I meet him, he's not going to say, who are you? He's going to say, come on in, my good and faithful servant, Neil. I'm going to be found doing what God wants me to do. And if he tarries and I go to 95, I pray that I'm still doing it. Amen. Look at this dear sister here. She's still here, loving Jesus. If God's talking to you this morning, you might be struggling in some areas of your Christian life. I don't know. But if you want to take advantage of this altar, take advantage of it. Come out and let God touch you. Let God touch you. Let God touch us. Amen. Now lift up your heart. God, I want you to touch me this morning. I want you to sort some things out and unravel some things because I've been affected by this world. I, I was disappointed in this and I'm disappointed in that. And we prayed and we believed and we said and we did and we didn't. And it happened and it didn't happen. <laughs> Don't let it stop you from believing. Take advantage. Renew in me a passion for. 